Hello and welcome to today's second webinar. Thank you so much for taking time out and being here again today. And my name is Ayong. I am the host for this webinar. And also I am the marketing and educational seminar coordinator here at Neobiotech. And today's topic is the planning for extra maxillary diagnostic surgery with Dr. Dennis Smiler. And also I will make an announcement right after our lecture in regard to upcoming webinars and also watch previous webinars as well as the how to receive your C credits for this webinar. So please stay until the end. And also let's stay uh, connected with us on social media. I leave our social media page in the chat box. So our Facebook page is Neobiotech USA and Instagram is Neobiotech underscore USA. And lastly, YouTube channel is Neobiotech USA. So, and we are also strong, strongly recommended to use the chat box to communicate with me if you have any technical issues other than the topic. And we will have a Q&A session at the end about this topic. So please submit your questions through this Q&A box. So uh, one thing that I wanna address is Dr. Smiler may not answer all of, of your questions since we have a short period of time, but I will leave his email address in the chat so uh, you can feel free to ask him any further questions. So let's just jump into today's lecture. Um, hello, uh, hello, Dr. Dr. Smiler. Hello, Aaron. How are you? Everybody all right? <laughs> I'm doing great. Good evening. All right. I will right. take over to you. Are we ready to begin? Yes. <clears throat> well, then, good afternoon, everyone from sunny California. It's a wonderful, beautiful day here, sitting in my downstairs office doing this webinar. It very much is a pleasure, you know, to be, to be presenting today. So with today's webinar, I'm going to present some of the facts and ideas that we can use to increase the predictability of placing zygoma implants. Now on Thursday, I will do session two, which will be planning and surgery for pterygoid implants. That will be Thursday, the 28th at 11 a.m you know, Pacific Daylight Time. So with that little bit of information, let's get started. Some of you already know who I am, and I've met most of you, I think, that's on, the, uh, on this webinar, but I am an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. I've been placing and doing implant surgery for a number of years, and been focusing now on routine uh, conventional implants, but more today on the zygoma, and later on Thursday, we'll talk about the pterygoid implants. So today's topic, I will discuss a little bit about the atrophic maxilla, some information of the surgical anatomy of the zygoma implant, because placing a zygoma implant is dictated by the anatomy. We can do CT scans, we can do the evaluation, but it all rests after we lift the mucoperiosteal flap and we see with our own eyes the anatomy of the patient. Then we're gonna talk about points, lines, and angles. And this is gonna help us plan the positioning of our point of entrance to the zygoma, as well as where we're gonna be placing this on the arch. And then we'll talk about the zygoma anatomy guided approach, which allows us with different scenarios to contemplate where the path of that zygoma implant is going to be. I'll show you what we do on some anatomic models. And then uh, I wanna discuss, although there are many complications that can occur, I do wanna discuss what most are going to be concerned about, and that's gonna be the orbital complications. And we'll show one or two cases. On Thursday, um, I will also present maybe three or four other cases that will elucidate the positioning of zygoma and pterygoid implants as well as the prosthetic reconstruction. So the second session will be mostly pterygoid implants. Uh, the surgery, again, with points, lines, and angles, which will become evident as we proceed with this lecture. And then we'll talk about nasalis implants and how we can anchor them into the piriform aperture of the nose or, or the uh, uh, vomer. And then we'll discuss some cases. So with that basic information, let's get started. So this is the dental cripple patient. 
that until today really had no future with an implant supported restoration. We've all seen these kinds of patients, you know, that have come into the office. They're horrified that we cannot do anything with implants or bone grafting, and we condemn them to just wearing a full upper denture, which is loose and unstable. Uh, these two x-rays tell the whole story. Uh, the sinuses are very large. There's very little bone between the crest of the ridge and the antrum. This is usually anterior bone that is uh, atrophic with severe resorption. So the treatment plan that we could do on this patient is possibly sinus lifts, wait five or six months, put implants in, wait another five or six months, uh, then do the healing abutments and then progressive loading. And then about a year and a half later, maybe we all have everything supported so we can do an implant supported restoration. As opposed to what we're now doing with zygoma implants, where we have surgery in the morning, and it's very possible in most cases to have a fixed temporary prosthesis after surgery on the same day. Notice here that the incise of the pillar is right on the crest of the ridge and the knife edge ridge. Very difficult to reconstruct this patient, especially in the anterior region. But the fact that the nasopalatine ductal system is over here indicates that we have lost about 15 millimeters of horizontal bone. And the morphology of this alveolar, alveolar ridge is deficient in width, in height and volume, so as not to be able to place conventional implants. And the patient then is condemned to just wearing a removable full denture appliance. You look at this case, what hope can we give this patient? We got bone resorption almost all the way up to the floor of the nose. We see the piriform aperture of the nose in this region. Again, we see the nasopalatine ductal you know, position, but there's complete loss, almost complete loss of alveolar bone, and we're down to basal bone. So before we get started with the surgical technique of placing the implant, the zygoma implant in the maxilla, a little brief destruct, destruct, <laughs> discussion on the anatomy. Of course, when I reflect or you reflect a mucoperiosteal flap, all of the muscles, nerves, arteries are on the other side of the periosteum, also near their insertions. The only uh, difference would be is right here at the infraorbital rim, because we might see that infraorbital canal for Raymond when we're doing the dissection. So I think here, one should be interested in the medial pterygoid muscle. This will more often come into play when we're placing pterygoid implants. All of the vascular structures are reflected with the intact mucoperiosteum. Again, the only exception are the vessels of the infraorbital nerve and canal, where it comes out through the canal. At the area of the zygoma and the zygomaxillary complex, note the insertion of the masseter muscle. In the dissection to the zygoma, it's imperative that there is no sharp dissection of the infratemporal fossa because injury to this muscle is going to cause copious bleeding. It's very difficult to control and you have to control this with the pressure. Um, in such a situation where this has happened, I do recommend the use of avitine. That's A-V-I-T-E-N-A. -E this is microfibular collagen. And add this as an adjunct to apply pressure to control the bleeding. And it's just a matter of time. You have to then put pressure and wait for the bleeding to stop. But the, the take home message here is that we should not, buy, we should not be dissecting in that infratemporal fossa region. Dissection of the superficial masseter muscle does nothing for the exposure of the maxilla and the zygoma. We are going to be up in this region. We don't want to dissect this off of the zygoma, the zygomatic arch. Also, the deep masseter muscle, as you see here, does not enter into the dissection 
and we shouldn't even be back that far. We're going to be in this area where the maxilla and the zygoma. The temporalis muscle runs deep and medial to the zygoma and also does not play any part in the dissection. We're way far away from out of the, of injuring the muscles of mastication during this surgical procedure. If you look at the zygoma, we have suture attachments. We have the zygomatic arch over here. We have the suture attachment to the infraorbital, canal, infraorbital rim and also into the, into the maxilla that's over here. So we have three suture attachments that we're going to look at and our implant is going to be in this position. On the zygoma, we have no reason to be back here in the zygomatic arch. An important slide, because the dissection must, dis must dissect to extend and to include the space between the lateral rim of the orbit and the zygoma in this position. In that position is where we're going to be placing our zygoma uh, retractor that will give us access and retention of the flap. So if you remove here the zygomatic arch, it shows that we're looking at here is really type one corticocancellous bone in this region through which the implant, zygoma implant, is going to pass. This region is type one bone, much as what we're going to find in the anterior mandible. And it is in this area that that implant is going to be osseointegrated. Proper placement of the zygoma implant is going to be defined by the anatomy of the zygoma maxillary complex and the maxillary sinuses. You see a little bit of an outline of the sinus over here. And we're going to discuss whether or not that implant is going to be extra maxillary going into the zygoma, or if the implant is going to be passing through the maxillary sinus, and then how to be doing this predictably and safely. The morphology of the zygomatic maxillary complex dictates the position of the implant from the alveolus to the zygoma. Some implants are going to pass extra maxillary. Some implants are going to be passing through the sinus. It all depends on the anatomy of each individual patient, which we can look at when we're doing our CT scans. Now, what's nice is what we can do is make a stereolithic model from the CT scan. So we have an idea of what the anatomy is going to look like after we make the dissection and give us some indication of planning where the pilot holes are going to be and the path of insertion for the zygomatic implants. With the stereolithic model, the clinician can plan the the proposed insertion and exit points. We're going to see here in the, say, the distal of the second bicuspid region and over here maybe in the canine area. And it also gives us an idea of the morphology of the bone before we do the surgical procedure. This is just another angle showing the possible points to place the pilot hole into the zygoma. So a little bit about the incision and how we reflect that mucoperiosteal flap and what are the structures in the bone that we need to see before placing the implant. Well, when, my was, when I was in my residency, I was told that big surgeons make big incisions. So we want to make it a large enough incision so we can see a mucoperiosteal flap that's going to provide us with exposure of the surgical site. So this is a midline incision from the floor of the nose to the alveolar crest. The crestal incision is made more towards the labial buccal region to allow for easier reflection of the mucoperiosteal flap. 
if you make that incision more towards the palate, there is more difficulty in taking that incision up over the alveolar ridge. Posterior, on bone at the, behind the malar buttress, you'll make a vertical relaxing incision. And if you need more reflection, we can then make a little dog tail incision to extend that, uh, extending this incision here, the lateral releasing incision. So what we'll look at here is the alveolar ridge. We're going to see the maxilla, and we're back over here in the uh, malar buttress region at the maxillary wall. Now, as strange as it might appear on the surface, I would suggest that we all be aware of where Stenson's duct is in relation to how we make the incision in the vestibule in that vertical relaxing incision. There have been cases when that incision is made too far into the vestibule, that Stenson's duct is then cut, which is not a good thing to do. There should be no reason why we should be out there because our incision should not be here in the vestibule, but should be over here on bone distal to that malar buttress. You lift the flap with tissue forceps and here, we're using a dissector that dissects from the periosteum off of the bone. And we wanna do this without tearing the periosteum. So the dissector is a wonderful instrument just to dissect that area between the periosteum and the bone. The malar buttress is exposed, as is the uh, buccal wall of the maxilla. Behind the malar buttress is that infratemporal fossa and we should have no sharp dissection back here. Now, if we want to expose a little bit more of that infratemporal fossa, what I do is take a moist two by two sponge and place it on bone and push it ahead with uh, an instrument like a retractor or a periosteal elevator. And that will strip off this bone and give you a little bit more exposure without making any damage to that muscle in this region. The only admonition is that you gotta remember that you have a sponge up here because this is gonna be saturated with blood and we don't want the occasion where we're suturing everything and then we find that we have left the sponge in the area. So you might wanna make a suture around that sponge or have some other way of indicating that you have a sponge in that area that has to be removed. Now I wanna demonstrate where this dissection is going to be to place the zygomatic retractor in that region between the zygoma and the infraorbital rim. So to illustrate this, what I'm doing now is passing, having a passing needle. It's inserted into that soft area between the zygoma and the lateral orbital rim, and it's angled down into the mouth. So, in this position where that needle is passed, that's the position where our retractor, the zygoma retractor is going to be. This is that little soft area that we can all palpate from the zygoma and the lateral orbital rim. And you see how that now extends into the mouth along the malar buttress. So it is along this area that you're going to do your dissection so that you can expose the region of that area between the zygoma and the lateral orbital rim. Now we make a pilot hole, and that is placed at the superior lateral aspect of the zygoma, at a minimum of three millimeters from the posterior vertical edge of the zygoma. And the, region, the reason for that is that if this pilot hole is made within that three millimeters, there's more of a chance of fracture. So we want to avoid this. And I'll show you as we move on here, a way that we can look at this. Into that pilot hole, we now have the Norris diamond drill. It's placed into this pilot hole and then it is angled, usually in the position of the distal of where you would have the second bicuspid, or if we're doing a quad zygoma, this would be angled over here to the canine region. 
But this is a wonderful instrument. It's diamond covered, and you put the point into the hole, and now you bring that drill forward to the alveolar ridge, and you're going to remove whatever bone that you need to remove on the lateral wall of the maxilla. So here you can see that this is that channel. This is where the implant is going to be placed, and we see a little opening of the sinus membrane. But because this is a diamond crusted, you know, barrel drill, we have very little chance of tearing the sinus membrane. And if we do tear the sinus membrane, those of us <clears throat> who have been doing surgery in this area for some time know it is not a catastrophic event. So for an all on four restoration, we can have one zygoma implant, which is placed bilaterally, and you combine that with conventional implants. When the ridge is very, very thin, we're gonna put two zygoma implants bilaterally for an all on four restoration. As we're doing the planning part, we wanna make sure that between the inferior implant and the superior implant, we have a distance of about 10 millimeters. We wanna make sure that this is not too close to each other to the implant because you're taking away too much bone and the implant may, may fail. What's important when we're placing implants is the position of this inferior implant. If this is placed correctly, then placing the second implant exiting over on the lateral incisor <coughs> or in the canine region becomes easy. Here we see a quad zygoma for an all on four restoration. <clears throat> so we talked about <coughs> what we're going to talk about with points, lines, and angles. Um, you don't normally see this in other lectures, but this is important in my estimation because it gives us an idea of where we're going to be placing the pilot hole in the position of the implant on the alveolar ridge. So this go, takes us back to really high school geometry. Uh, we learned this concept way back then in <clears throat> Euclidean you know, geometry. So we owe this back to this guy, Euclid of Alexandria, back in the third or fourth century you know, BC. And we're looking at points, lines, and angles. Now, why this is important is this. This quad zygoma is in good position. The lower implant travels a path <coughs> from the distal of the second bicuspid to enter into the zygoma. The upper implant path is from the canine region to the zygoma, probably through the sinus. Now we have to think, how do we get there? This is truly an ideal position for a quad zygoma. Well, if we go back to looking at points, lines, and angles, in this scenario, the point of entry into the zygoma maxillary complex is very high. In this position, the path followed from the first molar is going to take you into the orbit. And even in this position, the path, say, in the distal of the second bicuspid. This path is going to take us into the orbit. So we need an, an idea and a system that's going to avoid that complication. So lowering the entral point, but keeping the path from the molar region here, still places the implant very close to, if not into the orbit. But if we move the path of insertion to the distal of the second bicuspid area, the implant is effectively into the zygoma in an excellent position and also giving us enough room to place our second implant if we're doing a quad zygoma. Here we see both implants are anchored into the zygoma and in good position for an all in four restoration. A good time to discuss now is that the implant is osseointegrated into the zygoma. We are only placing it close to the alveolar ridge, 
but there is no osseo integration of this implant on the ridge, none. There is only soft tissue covering. The anchorage and the osseo integration occurs here in the zygoma in that type one bone. Now, if you move the superior implant point on the maxilla, there is still a path to the zygoma anchorage. So we're just moving that superior implant insertion point lower. And we're bringing it over here into the canine region. Remember that you wanna have about 10 millimeters of distance between the proposed uh, position of the two implants. You can also keep the insertion point of the upper implant and move the path of insertion anteriorly to the lateral incisor. Why would you want to do that? Well, in some cases, we have seen that the maxilla is very small, and placing it in the canine region would be very close to that implant in the second bicuspid area, and we'll move it forward to the canine region. But we still have insertion of the implant into the zygoma. This is just a view from the undersurface of where we're placing our pilot hole. Now, there is one thing that you have to consider, and that is how close is the implant from the lateral aspect of the zygoma? You need at least a minimum, if not more, of bone between the lateral aspect of the zygoma and the entrance point for the implant. If it is too close, you really run the risk of fracturing this bone, and of course the operation has to be discontinued. In this sequence, notice that the entral point is very high and close to the infraorbital canal. The angle of approach and the path of the implant that the implant follows is a line to the point of insertion. To examine the trajectory of the implant in relation to the orbit, what I do is place a long instrument on the facial aspect uh, and make sure that it is parallel and right on top of where the drill is. So this is placed on the face and exactly over the path of the implant. Now, from the facial view, you'll be able to see the trajectory of that implant and the drilling procedure, and you can see here we're going to be far enough away from the orbit. This image here shows the insertion point and the burr hole into which we're going to be doing the Norris uh, Diamond sinus drill to make ourselves a little channel of where we're going to place the implant. In this scenario that I have here, the insertion point is very close to the lateral border of the zygoma. We have to determine how much bone do we have. So what you can do is that you find that the uh, area here of the point of contour, highest point of contour on the zygoma and take an instrument like a uh, measuring guide and you place this on the height of contour and manipulate this point so that it's exactly parallel to your drill or to where your implant is going to be. This will then give you the distance because of, again, back to geometry, this will give you a distance from the lateral rim to your purchase point. Now, if we move that insertion point down, we increase the amount of bone between the implant and the lateral border of the zygoma. So that instrument has to be placed at the height of contour, and this is the distance of the amount of bone that you have available for your insertion and your pilot hole for the implant. Now, if you move the pilot hole, the insertion point, too far to the medial, on this first implant, the inferior implant, you're going to be going through the sinus or into the sinus. So we want to position this more on that lateral aspect. We're going to leave this area for our second implant doing a quad zygoma. 
This is just a different view showing the outline of where the sinus and where you would like to have your pilot hole for that inferior implant to be placed. Planning for a quad zygoma means that we have the inferior implant in this position, high and lateral on the malar buttress, and the second implant is going to be going through the maxillary sinus. So that implant will take a path from the canine region through the bone, in through the sinus, into the zygoma. Make sure that we keep at least 10 millimeters between these two points. So here we see this picture shows the uh, zygoma implant position from the alveolar crest to the anchorage in the zygoma. And this is our type one bone. This is where the anchorage is for the implant and the osseo integration is going to be, not from the crestal region. With our CT scan, we can see the right and left zygoma compartments. We see the cortical cancellous portion and the trabecular pattern. This is excellent bone in order to, into which we can anchor that implant. So here we're planning for a quad zygoma from our CT scan, which is going to give us as surgeons an approximation, a good approximation, but still approximation of where we're going to be placing that implant. All of this is going to guide us, but the final definition of what we do is going to be after we lay a mucoperiosteal flap. Give attention to the entrance point of the lower implants and the path of insertion. This allows us now to do quad zygomas, avoiding the antrum. Dr. Aparicio introduced the uh, zygoma, zygomatic anatomy guided approach, or what we now call Zaga. It was first published in Periodontology in the year 2000, and it's certainly an article worth reading. And it gives us a guide of where we're going to be positioning the implant. That is, the implant is going to be either through the sinus or it's going to be completely extra maxillary. Now, here we see in this position the implant is placed through the sinus. This is determined by the anatomy of that lateral wall of the maxilla or on the bone or completely <coughs> extra maxillary. Now, we can look here. The lateral maxilla is concave, and the implant is placed in an extra maxillary path from the ridge all the way to the zygoma. Notice that the implant is not placed in the palatal aspect of the alveolar ridge, but right on the crest of the ridge. And this is our newest technique of placing zygoma implants. In type zero, uh, schedule Dr. Aparicio describes that this is where the anterior maxillary wall is very flat. So the first osteotomy is placed on the residual alveolar ridge and it goes through the sinus and it follows that intra sinus path into the zygoma. In type 1 anatomy, after we've made the flap, we can look at this. The anterior maxillary wall is slightly concave so that the path of the implant body remains outside the boundary of the sinus, but still is on bone. In type two, the anterior maxillary wall is more concave and most of the implant body follows the extra maxillary path. Notice that there is no space between the implant body and the lateral wall of the maxilla. Type three is where the anterior maxillary wall is very concave, and most of the implant body is going to be outside the maxilla. The middle part of the implant in this region does not touch the bone. In type four, there is vertical and horizontal resorption. 
the head of the implant is placed to avoid perforating the thin bone cortical plate of the residual ridge, and the implant body is extra maxillary into the zygoma. So we do not want to then make a large opening, a large concavity on this thin ridge, but this is where the implant is going to be housed on the alveolar ridge. So now let's look at how we place these implants on anatomic models. And this is what we teach when we're doing our zygoma courses here and in Brazil. Although I think we're going to be maybe next year before we're back to Brazil to do our live surgical course. But we do the same procedure in our cadaver course that we do here in Long Beach. Here is the norosurgical kit for placing the zygoma and pterygoid implants. These will be the pterygoid, these will be the zygoma implants, long or short drills, and especially that diamond drill that is very important. So the incision is marked on the model, and we're gonna make that vertical relaxing incision is going to be over here, posterior to the malar buttress. Using the dissector and tissue forceps, we're gonna take that mucoperiosteal flap, reflect it to an area where the area between the zygomatic arch and the lateral orbital rim, because this is where that retractor is going to be placed. And once you put this retractor in that position, don't move it. You and or your assistant holds it, and you don't move it going back and forth because that's only going to cause more swelling and uh, irritation. The pilot hole is drilled, and the tip of the Norris diamond drill is positioned in the hole. Now, using this hole as a pivot point, the drill is angled to the alveolar crest and removes the overlying bone as it is positioned, say, in the second bicuspid area. So all the overlying bone is removed with the diamond drill. Then it's normal sequential drilling, like all of us have done with conventional implants. And a measuring gauge that we see here is placed to give us a, the length of the implant that we're going to be placing. And these are the, uh, the exercises that we use here with these implants. The implant is 4.2 millimeters. And in this situation, or in this case, the implant length is gonna be 42.5 millimeters. We have the pilot hole. This is the channel that's been placed by the diamond drill. And we've done sequential drilling. And now we're gonna be placing the implant. What is important is to take your thumb or finger and press the implant on that little C notch that you have on the crestal bone. We wanna keep that implant very close, in close proximity to the bone. Now that the first implant is done, we can make the second drill hole 10 millimeters away. We can see that this is now in the maxilla. So for sure, that implant is gonna be traveling through the path of insertion through the maxillary sinus into the zygoma. So with this, we're gonna take the diamond drill and the drill is gonna be angled anteriorly to the area of the, say, the canine region. This then is gonna produce this channel through which we're going to do sequential drilling, smaller diameter to larger diameter implant, perforating the bone in the region of the zygoma. We see perforation here. We'll measure the amount of bone, but because we perforate, we're gonna get bicortical stabilization of the implant. And then the second implant is placed. This implant obviously is going to be longer than the first implant because this line angle is different. This is much longer. Again, placing it, make sure that your finger is on the ridge, holding the implant close to the alveolar crest. And now we have a quad zygoma. If you look at this from the aspect of points, lines, and angles, it should become clear 
what your position of your pilot hole and the path of insertion of the implant is going to be. So let me show you this case. Uh, this is done with local anesthesia. Uh, this is done, Dr. Rosen and myself are doing this case on your local, it's a quad zygoma. Then the patient presents with preoperative photos. We see that there's rotten and very decayed, loose lower teeth, mandibular teeth, and it is not so healthy in the maxilla. There's loss of vertical dimension. And if you notice here, the distance from the nose down to the lip, you see the loss of dimension. Of course, we know these lines are gonna show us that smile line only because there is, uh, the mandible is closing more towards the maxilla. This is our preoperative scan, giving us an indication of where we're gonna be placing implants and what we're going to do to remove the failed teeth. And if we're doing local anesthesia, it's extremely important to make sure that we do it correctly. We want it at the posterior superior alveolar region, the anterior superior. We want it at, at the nasopalatine area, back here the greater palatine, infiltration also along the palatal region, and most importantly, a lot of local anesthesia at the angle of that soft spot between the zygoma and the lateral orbital rim. Now, we made the incision along the crest, reflecting the bone, here we see the infratemporal fossa. And the pilot hole. Pilot hole is low and lateral on that arch. Now into the pilot hole, We've just placed the, di the diamond drill. And that creates our path from the pilot hole to the area of the first implant at the distal, say, of the second bicuspid area. And because we're using the Norris diamond drill here, we see the sinus membrane, but it's not torn. And again, if it does tear, we're not really concerned about this. And then we have sequential drilling to give us the length as well as increasing the diameter, copious irrigation. And then the measuring guide is placed into the defect, into the uh, receptor site to determine the length of the implant that we're gonna be placing from the zygoma to the alveolar ridge. This part of the implant is what's going to be in the zygoma, that apical part. This is responsible for the stabilization and osseointegration of the implant. The implant is placed, and this could be torqued to 60, 70 Newton centimeters. Now, this patient is going to walk out in the afternoon with a fixed appliance so Dr. Rosen is now placing the uh, uh, multi-unit of abutments on top of the implant. And now we're ready for the second, making sure that we have 10 millimeters, at least at behind, uh, from both implants. Pilot hole, more than likely, this is going to be going through the sinus. But into that pilot hole, we use the Norris diamond drill and move it into the area, say, anteriorly in the canine region. This will be an all-on-four restoration. Sequential drilling to the approximate length and then putting in the guide, measuring guide, to make sure we have an accurate measurement and the implant is placed. Multi-unit button is now attached and we turn our attention to the other side. I want to reinforce the local anesthesia before making the incision. And again, we're back here at the infratemporal fossa where we're not gonna do any dissection. The infraorbital nerve is up in this area. We're gonna be concerned in this region of the lateral border of the zygoma. So again, as we did on the other side, making the pilot hole, the Norris uh, diamond drill, 
And as we position this, take this point, and we move it to the area of, say, the distal of the second bicuspid, this diamond drill is going to take away this bone on the lateral wall. We don't have to take another drill to make a window into that lateral wall because the drill is going to do it for us. Making sure here that I'm on bone. Making a, this is a measuring guide. And we're placing the implant. Notice that the implant is placed in that channel that's been positioned and been developed by the Doris Diamond Drill. Healing abutment is attached. And now making sure that we have this pilot hole 10 millimeters away from the inferior implant and knowing this implant is gonna be through an intrasinus path we're then going to put the Norris drill into that point, move it to the area of the canine region, and let the drill do the work to remove the bone and create that channel. Sequential drilling now through the channel and placing the implant. And again, with all four of these implants, you want to put a finger pressure on the implant as you're putting it into the bone. We want that to be at the uh, crystal region to be in very close proximity. And now we have, this is our post-operative x-ray of the quad zygoma. Multi-unit abutments, do the suturing. And now impressions are taken by Dr. Rosen, making the final prosthesis, and the patient ends up with this. This is a wonderful case for this patient came in with a failing maxillary dentition, a denture that doesn't fit, and in the afternoon, leaves with a full arch appliance, able to proceed having some solid food. So what happens when this goes into the orbit? How can we uh, avoid this type of complication that goes on? There are many other complications that could occur, bleeding, swelling, infection, very minimal for that. But the most complicated one, or the one that's going to cause the most problems, is going to be orbital complications. What you need to avoid is obviously having this implant through the floor of the orbit, into the orbit, and sometimes the eye. Now, it's very difficult to really get into the eye. You have to be way off base for that, because surrounding the orbit itself is a lot of fatty tissue, but you don't want to be in this position. So there are ways that we can change that. So how do we prevent it? Well, this is a Zygo guide that we developed. <clears throat> it is, again, based on, an, on geometry. This is the position of the drill, and we have another point that we put on the drill, but we make sure that this is parallel to the drill. We could do it with the drill, we do it with sequential drilling, it's also placed here with the Norris Diamond Drill. So we're going to put this into the bone and we want to make sure that the path of insertion is not through the orbit. So this is our spear drill to start the pilot hole. And we want to position this bar on the facial aspect directly over the drill, directly so that the path that this follows on the face is exactly the path that follows when we're placing the drill in the, uh, in the region of the orbit, or the zygoma. You do not want to place and use this instrument in this direction, in this position, where you're lateral and you're thinking that you have a lot of space here. They are parallel, but this parallel bar on the drill has to be directly over. So this has to be turned directly over where the drill is in this position, and that's the position of the trajectory of the implant that's going to be placed in your drilling procedure. So directly over the drill, here is the drill, directly over. Looking down at it, we can see that we're far enough away from the orbit. 
It's a very simple instrument called the, Z, uh, the Zygo Guide, and we'll talk more about this uh, at the next visit. So it's been a very nice time. We've spent some time together, and I will tell you that I think the lecture and the information here is very important, but you are not going to learn zygoma implant surgery by listening to a lecture or by going to a course where you're doing over the shoulder and watching somebody else do the work. The only way to do this and learn the procedure is from live surgery. So before we do that, a lot of our doctors come and take our cadaver course. Uh, this is the last cadaver course that we had in Long Beach. It's a very, very nice facility, but it gives everyone the chance to do the dissection on the cadaver, do the drilling procedure, placing the implants, and then having the opportunity to do a further dissection all the way up to and around the orbit and the arch to see the position and the anatomy of the area. We have two doctors per cadaver with instruction, so we're walking around doing the instruction. It's a two-day course with lectures and models, and we also give you stereolithic models of the cadaver that you're working on, so you can plan the case and you can take those home with you. But the piece de resistance, the best way to learn this is live zygoma implant surgical course, where you get to place the implants. So we've been doing this course in Brazil, and we know right now Brazil is close to us and probably will open up maybe October, November, or into 2021. And on this course, you get to do the surgery. Uh, we've had hundreds of paid doctors now who have come through the course and we've placed at each course, it's three days of doing live surgery, and we've placed at each course probably between 60 and 80 zygomas. We have an experienced faculty that's teaching you over the shoulder while you do the surgery. And in doing this procedure, all of the diagnostic procedures that we're looking at before we do surgery is only done with a panorex. And the reason is, is that one is difficult to get CT scans, but what we also know is that after we make the incision and do the mucoperiosteal flap, it is the anatomy that we see that dictates the position of the pilot hole and the path of insertion of the implant. This is our latest case. This is Dr. Rosen, Dr. Salvoni, myself, faculty, and our group of doctors. And we've had now doctors coming all the way from uh, England, New Zealand, uh, Afghanistan, Hong Kong. And it is really, I think, the only place that you're going to find a way that you're going to be learning this procedure. Now, we're going to be ending the seminar in just a moment. If we have other questions or you need more information, please email me. Very simple. Smiler, S-M-I-L-E-R, at smiler.net and I will get immediately back to you. So thank you very, very much for your very fine attention. Hope you have a wonderful following day of this presentation and you enjoy yourself with your family and friends. So I'll open this up now if we have any questions and I'll stay around for a while. So one question, oh no. At the end of zygoma implants are out of the bone that is exposed, does that problem for soft tissue into the osteotomy area? Actually, no. And the reason is that because using the Norris implant, it has a completely smooth surface. So it's very well tolerated by the soft tissue. But we're not talking about any part of that being encapsulated. It gets very tightly closed around the implant itself. Okay. So I think we're running out of time and I thank you all for your attention and I'm sure we'll be seeing you soon at other courses and around the different academy meetings. So long from Los Angeles.
right, Doctor, thank you very much uh, for your great presentations. Now I will just move on to the announcements by sharing my screen here. So stay connected with us again on social media. Um, our Facebook page is right here, Neobiotech USA, and Instagram is Neobiotech underscore USA. And lastly, our YouTube channel is Neobiotech USA. So follow us and also share our social, social media page, and you will see our up-to-date of the webinar schedules as well as all other um, the surgical kits related to that specific topic and if you are interested in taking up webinar courses you can find upcoming webinars in our website at www.neobiotechusa.com and click the webinar at the top then you'll be on our webinar page and for dr smiler will be lecturing on the session uh, two on this Thursday, May 28th at 11 a.m. Pacific Coast time. So save that date as well. And we will announce a June webinar schedule very soon. So please check our uh, website and also check out your email and also check our Instagram and Facebook page for this updates. And on this Thursday, uh, and afternoon, Dr. Chen will be lecturing on the fundamental of reach augmentation with GBR at 2 p.m. It's Pacific Coast time. So also save this date and all these courses are first come first serve basis. So please register in advance to reserve your spot. And um, if you have uh, missed any of these great lectures, you can watch this on our previous webinar page here. I just click on here and there should be more our previous webinars on this page. And after this webinar, one of our uh, sales rep will email you the course evaluation form. So once you receive it, please fill it out and I will send your CE up in completion of this form. And this form should take no longer than five minutes. It should look like this frame here. And I want to say thank you for all the doctors who participated in today's webinar. And also, we want to we hope to see you again next time. And if you have any questions, you can email me. Here is my email, ion.chy at neobiotechusa.com. And if you have um, any questions for, in regard to today's topic, uh, you can also email Dr. Smiler. I leave his uh, Dr. Smiler's email on the um, chat box. So feel free to email him. It's smiler at smiler.net. All right. I um, think that's it for the announcement. And um, thank you very much. So uh, for any of these questions not answered, um, Dr. Uh, Smiler may, you know, um, answer it. So you can just email doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Smiler again. <laughs> Oh, you're very welcome. My and pleasure. hope you also enjoy your rest of your Memorial Day. <laughs> well, I think so. I'm heading right now to the barbecue. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Great. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>